We are just a few days away from the greatest day of the year, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is easily the best holiday, and I'm going to tell you why. Reason one, food. There's nothing better than turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, deviled eggs, pumpkin pie, greens, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, lambs, rams, hogs, dogs, you name it. Reason two, leftovers. What holiday gives you leftovers the way that Thanksgiving does? Halloween doesn't do that. Valentine's Day doesn't do that. Have you ever had a leftover hot dog from the 4th of July? It's disgusting. Reason three, football. And the cherry on top is when Dallas loses like they will this week when they play Washington. Reason four, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is actually kind of boring, but super nostalgic. And occasionally a balloon gets away and adds some extra drama. Reason five, no gifts. That means you don't have the pressure of the giving and receiving of, of gifts that c- Christmas brings. You spend way less money. You don't have to pretend like you like the sweater that your mom got. You don't have to buy gifts for your second cousin twice removed who you only see once a year at Christmas time. And listen, if you're arguing with me right now in the chat, it doesn't matter. I recorded this on Monday. So now that that is settled, I want to know your favorite Thanksgiving side dish using emojis. Don't type it in, just use emojis. And here's what I want you to do. Click the like emoji if your favorite side dish is mashed potatoes and gravy. Click the heart emoji if it's stuffing. Click the care emoji if it's sweet potatoes of some kind, which really means it's just marshmallows and sweet potatoes happen to be a part of it. Click the laughing emoji if it's cranberry sauce. And click the wow emoji if it's something completely different that I didn't name at all. And if you haven't done it yet, you can go ahead and do that right now. And just so you know, as you do that, I'm going to totally judge you based on your responses because mashed potatoes are the goat of Thanksgiving and everything else is just filler. Now, with Thanksgiving in mind, we spent the last few weeks talking about gratitude. And my goal for this sermon series was to focus on thankfulness and help you build a culture of gratitude in your lives. Because gratitude is underrated. And research proves that there's a positive association between gratitude and an individual's health, including emotional health, relational health, and mental health. So over the past three weeks, I've challenged you to actually write out what you're thankful for. We've talked about how we express our thankfulness and how the Bible teaches ways for us to show our gratitude and how they're tied to the church and what we actually get to do on Sunday mornings, whether that's online or in person. And then CT talked about creating a culture of gratitude by starting new habits that go well beyond November. And as we close out the series, Today is going to be the most important week because here's what we are focusing on. What if I feel like there's nothing to be thankful for? What if I feel like there's nothing to be thankful for? Because I know people who are struggling right now to think of one thing that they're thankful for, let alone a whole month's worth. I know people who aren't struggling with what to do when they're thankful but are waiting for something good to happen so they can actually express their gratitude. People who've lost jobs, now they're trying to figure out if they're still on the right career path or if they need to completely start over. People who have had family members pass away, which was already hard enough, but now the holidays are coming and they're just a sad reminder of the loved ones who are no longer with us. People who haven't seen their friends or family for months because someone is high risk, And while that's the best thing for their physical health, there's a mental health impact and they're struggling. People who've had their businesses or their churches close. People who have had friendships severed because of betrayal. People whose marriages are ending or are very close. People who received a diagnosis they didn't expect. So the question is, what if you feel like there's nothing to be thankful for? What do you do then? When nothing is going the way you expected, when it feels like it's just another year of working a dead-end job, of being single when you want to be married, of longing to have children but not being able to conceive, of trying to break the addiction that has control over your life. What is there to be thankful for? And I'm not going to lie. I feel this right now. I have absolutely struggled with this series because it's hard to focus on gratitude when times are tough, when the big things in life aren't going well. 
what is there to be thankful for when it seems like nothing is going right? Because if I'm supposed to bring gratitude into my daily life, having something to be thankful for seems like a must. So that is what I want to talk to you about today. And today isn't going to be about the two main focuses of gratitude in the Bible or the five ways to express gratitude or the multiple ways to build a culture of gratitude. Today is about one thing and one thing only, grace. Grace is getting something better than what we actually deserve. And this is really important because I think we often confuse grace with mercy. In fact, I see Christians do this all the time. Now, mercy is a beautiful thing. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Right? You get pulled over because you're clearly driving over the speed limit. But instead of getting a ticket because you broke the law, the police officer lets you off with just a warning. That's mercy. Most of us have been given a warning before when we've broken the law and been pulled over. So most of us have experienced mercy before. But grace is better than that. Grace is getting pulled over because you are clearly driving over the speed limit. But instead of getting a ticket because you broke the law, the police officer lets you off and then he writes you a check for $1,000. And listen, I know that this situation doesn't make sense, but grace doesn't make sense. And yet that is what God offers us every single day. Grace is the truth that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Grace is endless second chances. Grace teaches us that God loves us because of who God is, but not because of who we are. Grace comes free of charge to people who don't deserve it. Grace is life-changing and life-giving. Grace is recklessly generous. Grace comes with no strings attached. Grace doesn't keep score. Grace is love that seeks people out when they have nothing to give in return. Grace is love freely given and has nothing to do with what you can actually bring to the table. Grace is being loved when you're, when you're unlovable. Grace is unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. It's one-way love. Grace is unfair. It's unrealistic. It's unfathomable. And grace is the greatest gift ever given. And it's always available. So when you are struggling to figure out what you are thankful for, when it hasn't been your year or your month or you're just in a rough patch, there's always grace. Ephesians 2 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So if you are a follower of Jesus, it is the grace of God that has saved you. It's not something that's earned. It isn't based on your merit. It isn't based on good deeds. It truly is a gift from God. And at Collective, we talk about grace all the time because we need it. I need it. Because we're lost. Because we're broken. Because we have sin in our life that keeps dragging us down. Because we have pain in our life that we just can't seem to shake. And grace is the only way that we can have a relationship with God and receive the forgiveness and eternal life that he offers. And that's something that we can forever be grateful for. Philip Yancey wrote in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, that grace demands nothing from us, but that we shall await it with confidence and acknowledge it in gratitude. And here's what's fascinating. The word gratitude is derived from the Latin word gratia, which means grace, or graciousness. Gratitude is a thankful appreciation for what an individual receives, whether tangible or intangible. So with gratitude, people acknowledge the goodness in their lives. And they recognize that it often comes from a source that lies outside of themselves. And this helps us refocus on what we have instead of what we lack. So grace is getting something better than what we deserve. And gratitude is the natural response to that because grace and gratitude go hand in hand. This is where the idea of saying grace came from before you eat. You don't do it because you have to. Seriously, you don't have to pray before you eat. Your salvation doesn't hinge on whether or not you took a bite of food before you thanked God. But if you choose to pray before you eat, if you choose to say grace, you do so to acknowledge that God has blessed you in ways well beyond what you deserve. And listen, 
I want to be very clear that living in grace doesn't mean life will be easy. CT touched on this a little bit last week. We aren't saying that following Jesus means you can be grateful because nothing will go wrong and only good things will happen. So you always have something to be thankful for. That's not what we're saying. Following Jesus doesn't mean you won't have marital problems. Following Jesus doesn't mean you won't have financial problems. Following Jesus doesn't mean you won't have medical problems. If at any point in your life, a Christian person has told you that Jesus magically cures all of your problems, they lied to you. Jesus himself says in John 16, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus promises that there will be trials and sorrows, but he also promises that he is bigger than those trials and sorrows. He promises that he's bigger than the world. He promises grace. And this is something that we can always be thankful for. No matter what season of life you're in, no matter what you are going through, no matter how bad things get, you can be thankful. And that's what we're talking about. In spite of the bad things that are going on in my life, I can always be thankful for the grace that Jesus offers. Henry Nouwen once said, God rejoices not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children who is lost has been found. God rejoices when people who are far from him choose grace. God rejoices when people make the decision to let him be the leader of their life. God rejoices when lost people come home. And I'm just being honest, if you don't follow Jesus, if you're one of those lost children that Nowen is referencing, I'm not sure how you're surviving right now. I'm just being honest. But I think about this all the time. I can't imagine what this season would feel like if I didn't have grace to hold on to, if I didn't have Jesus in my life, if I didn't have those two things as constants every single day. Because if I wasn't holding on to the grace of Jesus, if my hope wasn't there, my hope would be in myself, and I constantly fall short. Or maybe it would be in politics, which we all know will always, always leave us disappointed in the end. We're in the economy, which is struggling. Or in our careers, which either feel like we're on thin ice or are relentless and exhausting. Or in our friends, our parents, or our spouse who constantly fall short because they're flawed human beings just like us. And I believe that that would just make a hard season almost impossible. But when you have grace, you have a glimmer of hope, a small bit of joy, a moment of peace in the middle of a storm. And here's the best example I can give of this. Part of my job is performing funerals. In just a few weeks ago, I was asked to do the funeral of a woman named Joanne. And Joanne had been coming to Collective for a few years. In fact, if you ever came to Collective when we were at West Frederick Middle School on a Sunday morning, you probably knew Joanne or knew of her. She was in her late 70s, and she would come with one of her sons, and he would help her in her wheelchair, and they would go sit toward the back every single week. And I remember when Joanne walked into Collective for the first time. It was one of our Christmas Eve services, and she came in with her son, Jack, and her daughter-in-law, Marumi. And after service, we got to talk a little bit, and that was when I learned that Jack and his wife were in town from Japan for the holidays, and they had somehow convinced Joanne to check out Collective so that they could all do church together. And as they walked away that day, I remember thinking, there is no way I'm going to see Joanne again. To be honest, she wasn't a typical Collective church person. But a few months later, she was back by herself. And then I saw her again. And then she started to invite her friends and her family. And then she started to attend one of our small groups that met on Thursday nights. See, Joanne didn't care that she was worshiping and hanging out with people that were her kids' ages. She loved our broken and messy church and was such a beacon of light for our community. And after preaching at the funeral, I had the opportunity to spend time with some members of Joanne's family. While everyone was very sad because they had lost someone they loved, there was still so much hope. There's still so much to be thankful for. And here's why. 
As Christians, we believe that when people say yes to the grace that Jesus is offering, and they put their faith in him, they get to spend eternity in heaven, an eternity without pain, without tears, without sorrow, an eternity where all things are made new. And Joanne's family knew that. They believed that. So they held on to that. So even in the midst of sadness, there was gratitude. And listen, Joanne didn't have an easy life. She went through a divorce. Her second husband passed away over 15 years ago. There was addiction, loss, pain, sickness, and a ton of grace. And the truth is there isn't anything better. There really isn't. There isn't anything better than this. Check this out in Romans 5. This is what it says. When we were utterly helpless, in other words, when our lives were a mess, when we screwed things up, when we didn't feel like we had anything going for us, when there was nothing to be thankful for, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Right? So Jesus came when we needed it the most and he died for us. He showed us grace. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. And so what this thing is, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that someone be, would be willing to die for broken people, to die for me, to die for an ungrateful, impatient, angry, selfish person like me, or to die for you. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. But because he loves us, he gave us something better than what we deserve. He gave us grace. He gave us a chance at redemption. He gave us a chance of forgiveness. And he gave us a chance to have a relationship with God that otherwise would not have been possible. And as John 1 says, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Never ending, life-changing, hope-giving, grace upon grace upon grace. So we thank God for that. And no matter what we are going through, we know that we have grace. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what we're going to do today to close out this series. We're going to take a little bit extra time for communion today. Because communion is the weekly reminder of grace. And at Collective, we intentionally set aside time every week during church for people to participate in communion. Because everything we do as a church points people toward a God who loves us and sent his son to give up his life so that we could be forgiven, so that we could receive the grace that he offers. And over the past few weeks, many of you, many of you grabbed take-home communion at the Thanksgiving bag pickup and drop-off. But if you didn't grab communion and you still want to take advantage of this moment, you can use any cracker and any juice. It doesn't have to come from collective in order to make this moment special or matter. The cracker and the juice are symbolism. The cracker represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. The juice represents his blood that was poured out for us. And if you are a follower of Jesus, this is a time every week, whether that's online or in person, where you pause, reflect, and give thanks for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us so that we could have a relationship with God. And we take this time to thank God that there's nothing we can do to make him love us more, and there's nothing we can do to make him love us less. So every Sunday, we prioritize communion because we prioritize grace, because that's what Jesus did. And if you are a follower of Jesus, communion is the reason why you don't have to get baptized every time you sin and walk out of alignment with God. Right? You don't need to be made new again and again and again. Once you've said yes to Jesus and been baptized, you don't have to keep getting dunked in water every time you mess up. That's what communion is for. It's a reminder of grace and the opportunity to remember that that gift came without any strings attached. And because of that, we're thankful and if you're not a follower of Jesus, or communion is something that you're uncomfortable with, that's okay. My challenge for you, though, is to take the next few moments to really reflect on what we talked about today and the reality that God is for you and he loves you. And if your hope is in something or someone else right now, 
And if you're wrestling with the fact that you've put your, what you've put your hope in isn't working out, or if you feel like you have nothing to be thankful for, we want you to know that grace is always available. And I know that that doesn't make sense. And I know that it seems too good to be true, because it is. But it's real, and it's free. And if you are ready to receive that gift, if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, we want to celebrate that with you. And the way that we do that at Collective is through baptism. And baptism is the physical representation of the faith you have and the choice you made to accept grace. And all you have to do is check the baptism box in your connection card online or on the app, and we will reach out to you this week to help you take that next step. And so no matter what, even if nothing feels like it's going right, you at least know that there's someone who loves you and there's someone who wants what's best for you and there's someone who thinks you're worthy and there's someone who will give you everything so that you can experience true freedom and there's nothing you can do to mess that up. There's nothing you can do to lose that. There's nothing you can do to push it too far away and that is the amazing, wonderful grace of God and that's something to always be thankful for. Let's pray. God, thank you so much um, that there's grace. God, that we have something to hold on to um, in these seasons of our life, these moments of our life, this time of our life where we feel like there's nothing good. God, when we feel like everything hurts, everything bring, brings pain, everything's going the opposite of how we wanted it to or expected it to. God, when we feel like there's nothing good going on in our life, we know that, that we always have grace. God, we always have the truth that there are endless second chances. God, we always uh, know that there's nothing we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing we can do to make you love us less. And God, for that, we're thankful. And God, I pray for every person listening um, who's not sure about you, uh, who's not sure about uh, letting you lead their life. God, I pray that this week they take a step back and try to figure out what are they thankful for? God, as they struggle to, to decide, um, struggle to see that anything is good, specifically as bad news continues and continues and continues, God, we pray that they remember grace. God, they remember the fact that you have offered that free of charge. God, with no strings attached for every single person, no matter how broken they are, how messed up they are, how much sin they have in their, in their life, how far they've run away from you, God, there is always grace, and it's always constant, and it's always waiting. So God, we're thankful God, as we continue in this season, as we continue uh, to deal with the ups and downs of holidays, God, I pray that in our lowest moments over the next few weeks and next few months, uh, we hold on to the grace that you've extended to us. God, we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.